Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go and newcomers to the series who are ready to jump in. I'm Marie Vigourou. And I'm Drew Shulman. In this mini-sode, we'll channel our own Angel Radio to answer voicemails. Let's get this show on the road. Welcome back, everyone. So this is our second Angel Radio episode during this hiatus, and we hope that you like them so far. (laughs) Now, for those who might not know, uh, we had some extra voicemails that we really wanted to be able to answer uh, because, again, you know, people take the time to uh, to send those to us, and we wanted to be able to honor those with a proper response and and slightly more timely than we've been so far because it's you know we're we're running late on a lot of these these voicemails. They're coming in like faster than we can answer them, which is like such a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> And we've also been told by a lot of listeners that they really, really love listening to voicemails. So we figured that we could do that to kind of like continue the conversation during this hiatus. If you are someone who would like to send in a voicemail or a message, you can go ahead and record it on whatever tool you like, like your phone, and send that that voice recording in or that message in to at carryingwayward at gmail.com. Yeah, so we started with um, a you know a very good trio of, <laughs> of voicemails last week. Uh, I I I'm still thinking about that, or two weeks ago actually. I'm still thinking about them, to be honest with you. That's the fun thing with voicemails is you never know how how they're gonna hit you and whether they're gonna be like emotional and like crushing and like leave you with these like heavy thoughts or if they're going to be like light fluffy and like give you a good laugh. And I mean, I love both ends of that spectrum, but you just never know. Just never know that, you know, voicemails are like a box of chocolates, really. <laughs> like you just never know. <laughs> but I'll still eat every single one. Maybe skip the coconuts. Well, let's start with the very first voicemail today. Uh, we have a voicemail from Shay. Gearing Wayward, I just recently got into your podcast, so I'm a little bit behind. But this voicemail is about season three, more particularly the ending. And you guys had mentioned that because of the writer's strike, Dean went to hell, but he wasn't originally supposed to. And I was just kind of curious how you feel that if he hadn't gone to hell, how that would have changed the show as a whole. Especially since we're into season four now and we learn that Dean is the righteous man and him going to hell and taking Azazel's place set the whole Lucifer arc in motion. He broke the first seal. So if their original plan about not sending him to hell had happened, would we still have Supernatural as we know it? Shay, thank you for that message. I... You know, it's really interesting when a show has these moments that I I guess like they have to then like work it into the existing plan in a way that maybe wasn't initially anticipated. And I mean, like the boring answer is I think that ultimately we would have gotten to where we were going just through a different route. Uh, I, I don't think the show would have not gotten to where we are, at least now with the end of season eight. But I think the path could have definitely been very different. Like, I think of how much of Dean's character has developed because of his time in hell. um, That even his time in purgatory would be so much more different had he not experienced hell first, I feel. So, would we be where we are today? Probably. But would we be the same? Would we have the same Dean? I think is the more apt question. And I really genuinely wonder. I mean, again... If this is the route they really wanted to go with him, maybe he would have ended up there at a different time, a different way. Or maybe we would have a completely different Dean today. And I mean, I love my Dean the way he is as much as he had to go through literal hell to be where he is. I I wish he didn't, but I also am glad he is who he is. And because he's fictional, I can say I'm glad he's gone through what he's gone through without feeling bad. But it's a very good thought exercise. It's very interesting, too, to wonder about these things, like how... 
you know, what was a decision that was made that was maybe not the original plan and how it's affected his character from what they initially had or what story beats had to be changed because of it. It's so interesting. So thank you for a very fun thought exercise. Thank you so much, Shay, for, for bringing this up, because I think you're absolutely right. There's, you know, Dean carries so much guilt from breaking that first seal, especially in in those seasons where that that stuff really matters, right? Like, and so much so that he <sighs> makes decisions sometimes that aren't necessarily the best. And he, you know, as we know, Dean has a very um, strained relationship with guilt in the sense that like he always feels guilty and, and ashamed, you know, his guilt transforms into shame. Um, and in this case as well, you know, his guilt for uh, choosing to torture souls in hell transforms into shame about how, you know, the, the virtue of his own soul. There's also one thing that I, I want to highlight is the fact that like if Dean hadn't gone to hell, we wouldn't have had Cass and we probably wouldn't have had angels in the way that we have them now. Because if we remember, Eric Kripke did not want to bring in angels in the first place. Like he said something about not wanting them to always have like a trump card to be able to put down like the, 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 the Winchester brothers, right. To like not have always that like ace up their sleeves in the form of an angel, or he felt, you know, he felt like they were just too powerful <laughs> for their own good, which, you know, not wrong, not wrong, Eric. I have to, I have to give that to you. So I think that the show would be tremendously different <laughs> is the answer. Like, I think that the emotional beats would have hit the same way in the sense that like, I think that the goal was always to have Sam sacrifice himself at the end of season five. Now I'm not even going to touch the rest of the, of the, the other 10 seasons, like the final 10 seasons. Cause I think that's a whole other um, can of worms. But I do think that in the first five seasons, the goal was to have Sam sacrifice, sacrifice himself for Dean and for the world. Like, I think that that was always what, Kripke wanted to do and I think that it looks a little bit different I think you know it looks like Lucifer and Michael whereas it might have looked like more demon-y than angel and and archangel-y but I you know like I said I think the emotional beats would have been the same for that relationship between Sam and Dean I think that Dean would also be a lot less damaged right like we see a change in his characterization before and after hell, you know, like this is, he spends most of season four kind of quietly dealing with that trauma. So I think that he would, he would definitely be a little bit different. He would feel different. Um, and maybe, maybe he would have less trouble accepting Cass's love and friendship in the beginning. I'm kind of wondering about that. Um, cause you know, one thing that he feels at the very beginning is that he doesn't deserve, he didn't deserve, he didn't deserve to be saved, right? Like that was his whole thing. And so I'm kind of wondering if maybe it would, you know, that's, that's the shame that, that is there, right? Like he did this bad thing, therefore he feels guilty. And therefore in his mind, he does not deserve to be saved, which is what shame does to you. Right. And so I kind of wonder if maybe Dean wouldn't be just a little, less uh, ashamed of himself if he hadn't gone to hell. I don't know if this answers your question, but those are kind of like the thoughts that just sprouted in my mind when you asked, uh, when I was listening to your voicemail. Oh, I'm just going to say, like, I think the idea that, like, we wouldn't have angels in the form we have them in is such an interesting point. Like, I remembered as you started talking about angels, I'm like, right, Kripke didn't want these things. Like, the power creep was an issue, and we've clearly seen the effects of that in the show. But I mean, like, if we didn't get angels, would we get leviathans? Or, like, it feels like every... It's like there's so many Jenga pieces stacked up here. There's so many dominoes in this game that, like, one being removed. Like, it really feels like Back to the Future. You ran over the tree, and now it's the one the one pine tree mall instead of the twin pines. Like, where would we be? Where, what would be... The, would it be, I don't know, Sam dating a werewolf while... Dean is, I don't know, an angel or something crazy. Who knows? It could be anything. That's the thing I think that is really interesting with these what ifs question. What if, you know, what if questions? 
it's that like I think that a lot of the stuff would be the same, but just like some details would be so incredibly different. We'd be like, what? <laughs> what's happening here? I have no clue what's going on. I don't think that it would have looked like Dean being the righteous man necessarily, because I don't think that that arc would have been a thing. Keep in mind also that like there was a possibility that maybe originally like the show was going to be three seasons and then five. And so like, I think that there was a lot that was kind of like, okay, well we have all this extra time. Like, what are we, what are we going to tell? And so like, I think that becomes like a different question, right? We always think about Eric Kripke as having like this ironclad plan, but I, I don't think that that's really what was going on. I think he kind of knew where he wanted to get to, but he didn't really mind how he got there. And, and I think those are re some really good, you know, strategies when you're, when you're uh, writing some, some interesting fiction. The number of shows I've heard stories of like what the creator intended versus what they ended up with because of so many things out of their control. Well, if we carry on, I believe we have a message from Gabby next. Hi, Mary and Drew. My name is Gabby, she, her, and I am such a big fan of your podcast. I enjoy listening to it every week. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the use of cinematography in the show, especially the, the colour grading. So um, talk a little bit about colour theory. So colour theory is a fundamental concept in filmmaking. It allows uh, filmmakers to tap into specific emotions with the audience. So audience members will learn to associate a specific colour with a specific emotion. Um, so this is something kind of critical to filmmaking. It's something that costume designers and cinematographers on Supernatural, they would have learnt in fashion school and film school. So uh, speaking of Supernatural, uh, throughout the show, I've noticed that they often use kind of a heavenly blue for Castiel. Um, there's, of course, his, his blue tie. And whenever he's not wearing his trench coat, you'll see him wearing blue, especially as like Emmanuel or later as Steve. And you also see, obviously, his his blue eyes, as Twitter loves to loves to mention. And then, of course, there's um, Sam. So he's visually distinguished with a kind of hellish red, which... Mary, I think you picked up on a lot throughout season seven that whenever they're hinting that he's being haunted by a Lucifer, there's, he's covered in kind of red lighting. And then finally there's Dean with his uh, green jackets and also his green eyes that he's kind of visualised with earthly tones of green and brown, but especially green, as the, as the fandom loves to note. Um, so to kind of summarise those colours, you know, Sam is the representative for hell in the narrative. So he has kind of hellish red and Dean is earth and humanity. So he's got a lot of green and brown and then Cass is heaven. So visualised with a kind of heavenly blue. And then kind of outside of Supernatural, these kind of colours uh, have meaning associated with them in film. So red is associated with love, passion, lust, danger, anger, violence, rage. Um, it's kind of associated with a lot of big, passionate emotions. Um, kind of like Sam in the early seasons, I think a lot of those emotions would apply to him. And then green, so Dean's colour, has a lot of associations with calm emotions of nature, freedom and youth. I think especially the associations of kind of nature and freedom are important to him as kind of the representative of humanity within the narrative, the, the first member of Team Free Will. And then Castiel's blue is associated with loyalty, unity, safety, order, also coldness and sadness and depression, a lot of melancholy and reflection, which I think with him kind of breaking away um, from heaven and his relationship to heaven being very complicated, those emotions kind of apply to him. And then, of course, you're probably wondering, well, there's a lot of brown and supernatural. A lot of hunters and the Winchesters in general wear brown. Um, so brown is actually created by mixing together two complementary colours, uh, most commonly red and green, so Sam and, Dean, Sam and Dean's colours. Uh, so brown is often seen as solid, uh, like the earth, and it's a colour often associated with resilience, dependability, security and safety. So if that doesn't describe uh, the Winchesters and hunters in general, then uh, I don't know what does. Um, and also just a little fun fact that if you look at a colour wheel, uh, blue and green, so Dean and Cass, they sit side by side next to each other. And then red and green, so Dean and Sam, they are opposite, but they're complementary to each other. So yeah, that's I just wanted to point out some of the 
the fun things about the colour grading of the show. As you go through, you can kind of keep an eye out on how they're costuming and colour grading the show with these colours. For instance, in Lazarus Rising, when Dean is rising up out of the earth and looking for his family, it's covered in green and brown colour grading. And then when Sam and Ruby meet, it's red. And then when Dean and Castiel meet, it's covered in blue lighting throughout. Um, so yeah, I just want to kind of note that it's kind of interesting. You know, I encourage you to keep an eye out on it throughout the show. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for the podcast. I enjoy listening to it. It comes out kind of early morning here in Australia. So I'll listen to it on my morning run on a nice sunny Saturday morning if we get it. But yeah, thank you so much for the podcast. Keep up the great work. Thanks. Bye. Gabby, thank you so much for this amazing voicemail. I absolutely, absolutely loved it. I'm having trouble um, with my words today. I, so yes, we've, you know, I think uh, we've, we've pointed out a couple of these and, and thank you so much. I particularly appreciated when you talked about Sam, you know, hellish red associated with hell, love, passion, big emotions. And I think that this answers some questions for me about why Sam feels so different in the later seasons. And obviously I'm not going to talk about that right now, but I think, um, I think I do want to come back to it at some point because this is kind of tickling a part of my supernatural brain rot that hadn't been tickled in a while. And so I, I thank you for that. <laughs> I don't usually like ticklish things, but like that was, that was actually really good. So being somebody who really loves tarot, I, when you started naming like the colors and what they were associated with, immediately I started thinking about like the elements, but also like the different suits of tarot, right? Like the different families. And so, um, you know, if we assign green Dean with uh, earth, right? As you suggested that we should do, if we assign Sam's red to fire, which again, like a lot of fiery, a lot of passion, a lot of love, lust, and all of that stuff. And if we assign Cass's blue to air, because I think that if, you know, if we're looking at heaven, we're definitely not looking at the, at the sea, the ocean and all that stuff. So I am going to go with air here. Um, just out of for like some, some, a little bit of fun here. I'm just going to name like the, the name of the suits that go with these elements. So for Sam's fire, we're talking about wands, right? So magic is associated with fire. Um, I think you all know how I feel about Sam and magic, and it's only going to get like more and more and more and more prominent in the later seasons. And I cannot wait to get there, but I think that that's like just a perfect match, perfect match for, for Sam. If we move to, uh, uh, sorry, not to Sam, we just talked about Sam, but if we move to Cass, who is blue, who is air, who is heaven, we are talking about swords or blades. Oh, come on. <laughs> I know, right? Like, and again, like the Michael sword, like I know that that's associated with Dean, but we know that, you know, green and blue standing side by side, you know, I feel like that kind of, works, you know, you've got your sword, try not to die by it kind of thing. So I think that that definitely works with, uh, with Cass. And then if we move on to Dean with the color green, that's associated with earth, we have pentacles, <laughs> uh, which again, I think is, is kind of like incredible Dean being a hunter and, and dealing with pentagrams all the time. Um, you know, these symbols of protection and, and whatnot. So I, I don't know. I know that that wasn't quite related to your voicemail, but I just think that like, you know, the, the, the meaning that we assign to certain colors, like goes so much further than, than color theory, even though it is incredibly fun to, to look at it in. But I just think that when you put all of those things together, like it just creates, like it weaves such a beautiful, like, um, web of intricacies. Like, I absolutely love it. So thank you so much for giving me those brain worms. And um, we'll talk more about Sam and Magic eventually. Oh, I'm excited for that. But I'm also excited for this voicemail because, again, like my schooling, I went to school, I dropped out of school, but I went to school for film theory and graphic design. So I've worked with both color theory and film theory hand in hand very closely, uh, despite being very colorblind. I was a 
gonna say it. I was like, just let's move on. <laughs> it's it's something I've learned to work around, and it's one of those things where it's like I know when I have the wrong color and how to find the right color through other tools. My grandfather owned a print shop and was incredibly colorblind, so he dealt with numbers and not the colors, right? He would have people point at the color and he would look at the number, and that's how he would deal with it. So it is absolutely possible. I learned how to read the hex codes that you use in graphic design colors, and then I figured out like what, not like mathematically, but like I, what worked well together, like how much of what shade to work with just through the numbers. So I knew I was giving something nice, but I'd always get someone with like, not screwed up eyes to double check for me. So in this, I really kind of love something that goes like a step beyond what you brought up, Gabby, is when they then mix around the colors to kind of like give that feeling of like something doesn't feel right. Um, Like the times where you do kind of get Sam in like lighter colors or in more of that blue spectrum. And it's like, there's something wrong. There's something off. Like you feel it without necessarily seeing it. Um, I I can picture there was an episode way back, I want to say season six, I think, where I was really like critical about the hotel room they were in or the motel room they were in. And it's because it was such a funky color and it was very prominently Sam in a room that was like mostly yellowish green. And it was like, it's throwing things off. And it was in an episode that really had Sam kind of like being the odd one out or like standing out or being kind of out of place. So it like, they can use color theory in both directions. Like it acts as a compliment, but then when you take it away and use it against the viewer, it helps create those levels of uneasiness. So having all three of them kind of like coded to a color and the like the things that go along with it that make them almost seem more natural. Like, you know, picturing, just because we recently talked about it in a previous voicemail, Dean and Hell, like Dean doesn't go with the reds as well as Sam does, but then when you get Sam in hell in the most recent season with Bobby, it's like he, it weirdly doesn't feel out of place. Like it doesn't feel like a, a, a hu- it's weird that he's in hell, but the, doesn't feel like as much out of place as Dean does in hell, which is really weird to say. I don't know. I, I think it's a great point you brought up and I really love using that lens, lens being my pun here of the day, to to look at these these episodes and these things. And it's something I, I definitely don't, keep top of mind as much as I should. So I am going to try to be more vigilant about it because I really do love it. And our final voicemail for today is from Destiny. (laughs) Destiny writes, Hello, Marie and Drew. As I continue watching the show, I start to realize the lost potential of all the female characters. They seem to only be able to write them a certain way. And if they aren't written that way, they are disregarded. We all know by now Supernatural only really does white American men the best. Women and people of color characters and POC characters are usually shafted in their portrayal. But how can a show who focuses on supernatural monsters and hunters not utilize the women villains better? Lucifer, Dick, and even Zachariah get full seasons to build up your hatred of them and show their cruelty. Yet the women villains and minor antagonists, such as Eve, barely even get a few episodes. Lilith, who was supposed to be the big bad of the season, they chase her for two seasons trying to reach her and stop her, and yet doesn't get doesn't even get that many scenes. She is mainly just out of reach the whole season. We won't even get to see her do any breaking of the seals, which they take time to list a few that were broken, so they could have utilized that time to show us some of it and build her up as a villain. And Eve, the mother of of monsters, was basically fridged. She's supposed to be one of the big bads, yet it's secretly Cass who is the secondary big bad with Crowley, but until this point, they built her up only to kill her in the first episode or second? And have her tell them about Crowley being alive? That's her whole purpose, to spread doubt to the Winchesters. It's wasteful. She could have done done that and still been menacing. Even recurring characters such as Bella, Lisa, and Joe aren't utilized to their fullest. This also includes other characters who haven't appeared yet. Bella could have been a fun, ongoing minor antagonist to the brothers. She was smart and quick, and I think she would have definitely made a play to stay alive. And Joe, we already talked about... Uh, was definitely fridged, but no need to rehash that one, because I could go on for hours on her wasted potential. But if they aren't being used for this reasoning, they are being used as mothers 
to these grown men, such as Ellen or Jodie. Now with Jodie, since she's played by Kim Rhodes, I can see her as a motherly figure to, due to growing up with her playing a mother on Sweet Life. Because of that, until Marie brought it up, I didn't realize how close in age she was to the brothers, only seven years older than Sam and three years older than Dean. And since she was being romantic with Bobby, I assumed she was closer to age with him, which I'm assuming the showrunners wanted us to think instead of looking it up or paying attention. It's hard because even the men that are secondary characters or just used to further the plot end up getting nobler deaths or more in-depth backstories or even longer screen time than needed. To cut my rambling off now, I wanted to know your thoughts on any character you think should have gotten more time to shine. And also, Marie, if you think the writing of women has improved once you got to the end of the show, or do they still treat them as plot devices? As always, your show is amazing and have a great day. Thanks, Destiny. Destiny, I, I feel like this is something I definitely want to like leave for Mary to really hash in on because the, the optics of it. Uh, but I will just say to and like one fully 100% stamp of agreement, like I fully see what you're coming to with this one. Like you said, we got time to hate Lucifer, Dick and Zachariah. Like we really got the like opportunity to. And like, I guess we almost kind of got it a bit with Naomi this season. But like, even then, I feel like even she was played a bit short. But like you said, like the women of the show really feel like they they were let down by the writing. Um, and I think the most critical example is Eve. Like 100%. I was so hyped for Eve as a character, especially after being basically like... Lilith basically being like a side note to a bigger story in the end. And then that she literally, like you said, I, I'm pretty sure we see her like twice before the brothers meet her. And then she's just immediately killed off. Like it is such a disservice to her. And I won't ramble for too long myself, but I feel like Bella also would have been one of those characters that would have been so good to like keep around like don't kill her off she leaves mysteriously and we don't know where she is and she can come up at any time kind of like we're doing with charlie now develop her let's you know learn to love her and who she is and her backstory and see her redeem herself or don't maybe she becomes a villain you know women can be villains too that's my new hashtag today i've decided uh, no no it isn't no stop please i didn't say that um but you bring up a sort of valid point, and I'm really glad that it's a conversation that we as a community are having, uh, and I will constantly amplify this message when I can. Yeah, thank you so much, Destiny, for bringing this up. I think, um, you know, of course, it, it's a bit tricky because of where we are currently in our coverage, right? But I feel like so many of these examples come from the first five seasons. So, you know, of course, Eve's, Eve comes from a little bit later, but... Um, I'm just really impressed with how misogynistic the show was in the first five seasons. Um, if you've ever heard me again, this, this feels like the Kripke bash. I'm so sorry. Um, but if I guessed it recently on a podcast called Supernatural Opinions, and I think it's the episode called The One Where There's No Peace When We Are Done or something like that, where we talk about uh, endings, show endings, and like uh, killing off traumatized characters. And one of the things that comes up uh, in this discussion is, is um, Eric Kripke's relationship with toxic masculinity. And it's, it's JJ who kind of coins it to say that like, in his later work, particularly, Eric Kripke, on the surface, seems to be doing a lot of work to kind of like question and dismantle um, toxic masculinity and, and therefore, you know, the patriarchal system in, in which we exist. But when you start digging and scratching a little bit, you start to realize that a lot of like the the undercurrent of that work, even that more recent work, is actually very, very stuck in this toxic masculine kind of way of thinking. And so I think that in those first five seasons that happen, you know, between 2005 and, and 2010, you've got like um, this person who hasn't yet interrogated those things. And so it comes out 
in this very um, brutal way almost, which which is, you know, killing off all of these female characters. You know, we talked about, you know, his his habit of killing off characters that are called Jessica because he had an ex-girlfriend called Jessica who, you know, you know, all of those kind of really weird icky things about him that we kind of learned that how excited he was to like blow out the, like to like blow up the, um, the roadhouse, uh, you know, he never even wanted to have more women on the show. He didn't want to write Joe and Ellen onto the show. This was something that was requested by the studio. Right. And he, he made that very clear and, so I think that this is what happens when you have um, showrunners who aren't really interrogating themselves on their own biases, right? On their own worldview. Um, you end up getting shows that really, really reinforce and highlight the different like systems that we are currently working under, like the patriarchy, like white supremacy, on and all, and, and like colonialism, like all of that is very, very present, especially in the first five seasons. I do think that there's a little bit of change that happens in the later seasons. However, like it was always made clear by the CW that this was a legacy show, right? And so they were always going to treat it as if it was made like as if we were still in 2005. And so I think that that's, that really was to the detriment of the show, uh, in my opinion, near the end. But here we are. I don't know if this answers your question, but this is, again, what kind of popped in my mind when I was uh, reading your, your email. So thank you so much. Thank you. I think it was a great answer, but honestly, and I think it was a great question. I think it was a great trio of questions again today. We always have good voicemails, to be honest with you. So this is, I think it's just, it comes out more. Like, it seems like they're really great because we have like three in a row. And so we get really excited about it. Oh, I'm loving this. This is definitely like, I, I'm having a lot of fun here. And I hope listeners are too. Uh, and I hope they keep sending in more fun voicemails so we can keep doing these. Absolutely. Please, uh, can you remind people how to send us a voicemail? Actually, Drew, I know we did that earlier, but we're going to do it again. Just in case you got the juices flowing, you know? Suddenly you're like, I'm inspired to pull out my phone right here, right now on this bus and record a thing. Do it. <laughs> we'll, we'll deal with the audio. But yeah, whether it's recording on your phone or writing us an email, uh, you can send that to carryingwayward at gmail.com. And we would love to get that on the show or in a future Angel Radio so we can answer some fun questions. Now, Drew, while we are on hiatus, can you remind people where they can find you on the internet? Well, Little Old Me can be found mostly on Twitter, at Boxless Thought, where I'll be promoting any of my upcoming voice acting gigs, shows, uh, as promised, by now I should have posted a thread of all of the episodes of Gate Leapers I've been on, uh, with a few fun comments and stories, hopefully to go along with it. Uh, and where can people find you? Well, I can be found at Mary Turner underscore on Twitter. Um, you can also listen to my other podcasts on, uh, you can look for the Gentleman Pirates Library if you like Our Flag Means Death. You can also look for Rude Eats if you like Hannibal. Uh, this one is still ongoing, so we don't have all of the episodes out yet, but the Our Flag Means Death one is complete. Uh, and like I said, I recently guested on Supernatural Opinions, and the episode name is the one where there is no peace, which, you know, is kind of my motto at this point. This was Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Marie Vigourou and myself, Drew Schulman. Thank you to everyone supporting us on Coffee or Patreon, especially our Bunker supporters, L, Jeremiah Thomas, and Simone. We'd also like to thank Jake Lionheart for our music and Jacqueline Tucci for additional sound editing. Head over to carryingwayward.com to become a patron or a Coffee subscriber, and for our merch store and socials. And write us a review on Apple Podcasts. Carry on our wayward friends.